Hey, welcome to Flatirons Online. Man, I'm so stoked that you're worshiping with us online today. And hey, one of the best things about our online community is that we have so many people watching from around the country and even around the world. So take a second, let us know in the comments where you're watching from. And if something sticks out from the message today, I encourage you, write that in the comment. Uh, we love to walk with you as you walk with God. I'd also love to invite you, if you live in Colorado, out to one of our five campuses across the Denver and Boulder area. Uh, our heart is for you to get connected. We wanna meet you, so reach out and get plugged in. If today has made an impact on you, if you love what God's doing through Flatirons, I just encourage you, take a second to like and share and subscribe to the channel. Uh, what God is doing at Flatirons is unique. We're glad that you're a part of it, and we know that someone in your life needs to hear the message today. So again, we're just so stoked that you're here, and I really hope that you enjoy the message today. Hey, uh, let me just say this. I'm so glad you all are here today. I, I know it's cold outside and, and snowy outside. I think God has you here for a reason. I do. And for the people at home that were scared to come out, my friend Judith's down here, she's 90. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> There's no judgment in that, but uh, anyway. Anyway, no, really, I'm glad you're here. You know, the, the, the best things I've heard all weekend so far uh, was church doesn't suck. I, I just think that should be on our t that should be our new T-shirt right there. And then this little kid came up to me earlier and said, "You look like a transformer." I'm like, I can shoot people, but um, anyway, uh, thanks for your prayers for this. It's getting better. But hey, if you have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your phone, and there's three Bibles in the back, we're gonna be in Genesis chapter three. We're, we're gonna be all over the place, uh, but we're gonna be mainly in Genesis chapter three. So today we are we're kicking off a brand new series where we're going to look at four stories over the next five weeks or so uh, of how this newly created world that we've been talking about in, in the last month, how it got so screwed up so fast and how God had back then and still has a plan today to redeem and fix uh, everything. Okay. All the way back in the beginning, he has a plan. The thing about these four stories that we're going to look at, and Matt kind of alluded to it last week, is we, we've turned Bible stories, especially these three of these four, into like children's Bible bedtime stories, right? And we tuck our kids in with them. But there's, there's this one story, uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm going to talk about it next week, right? Uh, in my 61 years of going to church, I've never heard this story taught on or explained in church. And next week you'll understand. You'll, you'll, you'll listen to the teaching and go, oh, that... That's why it's not in my kid's Bible. That's where demons come from. And so we're going to cover all that next week. And so it's Halloween. Here we go, right? So anyway, so the problem with some Bible stories, though, is that, you know, we read the Bible. If we go to church for a while, they become so familiar that we just read them and we stop learning from them or looking for what might really be going on. Or worse yet, sometimes we read the Bible and we project what we think it means or ought to mean and either walk away with something that's very different that God had in mind or God didn't say, or sometimes we just walk away from reading the Bible going, I don't, that's crazy. That, that's illogical. That's impossible. Like today's main character we're going to look at, a talking snake. And spoiler alert, all right, it's not really a talking snake. Anyway, but earlier this summer, when we began this, this kind of this study through Genesis, one of the things that we had to keep in front of us, see if you remember this, kind of was this, and it bothers us, but just, you, just think through it. The Bible was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. For us, but not to us. And now the Bible is definitely God's word for us today. It's very relevant. Today. And through it, God still reveals himself. God conveys his story, his eternal, unchanging plans and purposes. It's still, it's still good for today. But the Bible was written thousands of years ago by authors to an audience who had a very, very different worldview than we have in 2023. And I'm not saying people back then were stupid or uneducated. No, but, but the truth is, in 100 years from now, people will look back at us at 2023 and they'll think, how did they not know that? How, how do they not know that that's how it works? You know, fill in the blank there, right? Or, or 50 years ago, no one, no one would have known what you were talking about if you could have like, this would be so cool, teleport back in time and then try to describe an iPhone or the internet or Amazon same day delivery anywhere in the world. That's still witchcraft in my mind. I don't know how they do that. But, but, but if, if, if God wanted to write the Bible like a science book, he could have done that. Because he knows all about science. He knows everything and, and how the physical universe works because he created it. But instead, what God does is he conveys his story in a way that's timeless. It will span the ages so that if we see that there's more going on than what first hits you, you'll see the same timeless, eternal truth that was true back when it was written and is still true today. 
So with that in mind, I want to do a little kind of catch up or a quick review of what we've covered over the last few months. So we're kind of all on the same page in terms of definitions and some terms I'm going to use. All right. So first of all, God has what Psalm 82 calls, God has a divine spiritual family that the Bible calls the divine council. Okay, again, I wasn't raised with this, but it's right there in the Bible, right? This divine council is made up of some lesser created, they're not eternal, small g gods, which includes this one group called the sons of God. They're not talking about Jesus there, right? Plural, and these sons of God also share God's image as well as some angels and some other specific beings that have very specific tasks, all right? And we're gonna talk about those a lot next week, all right? God shares his rule and his reign with these spiritual beings in the heavenly spiritual realm, not because God needs help running the universe. He didn't need help with anything, all right? But God enjoys partnering with his creation and doing it with them and not just for them or to them. It's the same with us. When God created the heavens and the earth, he also decided to create us, human beings, in his image. And again, if you remember, that's, that's, a, that's a status, not an attribute. If we are human beings, whether we believe in God or not, we are the image of God. And again, God decided, his choice, he decides to share his rule and his reign with us when he commands us, here's kind of our marching lessons, right? To be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth, which doesn't mean dominate everything, It means work together with God, like live with God, take God's rule, his way, his truth, his life to anywhere on the earth where it isn't currently present. The way we said it last week was this, take Eden to the whole world. That's our job. And what is, what is Eden? It's very simple, right? It's where God lives with his family. It's where God lives with us. And and, and this is important. He lives with both his supernatural spiritual family and his earthly human family, all of us together. In Eden, all parties, supernatural and natural, are present. Now, the, the, probably the easiest way to remember what Eden is, or later Jesus calls it the kingdom of God, is to think of it as like two circles, and the top one is like the spiritual heavenly realm, and the bottom one is where we live, the earthly physical realm, and where they overlap, that's Eden. That's the kingdom of God. It, it's what Jesus prays for in the famous Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It also happens again in the final two chapters of the Bible, and eventually we'll get there, where heaven is not a place where we die and go live someplace else. Read the two last chapters of the Bible. Heaven and earth combine, and God comes here and makes his dwelling with us. Everybody still with me? That's all review so far, all right? So so let's pick up the story in Genesis chapter three, all right? Adam's there, Eve's there, God's there, and we're gonna see some, some other members of the spiritual realm are there in the garden as well. So Genesis chapter three, verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said, the serpent said to the woman, time out right there. If you're taking notes, write this down, okay? Snakes can't talk. Ta-da, I watch a lot of TV, they don't, all right, right? Snakes can't talk. Some people, usually Christians, in trying to make everything in the Bible absolutely literal, make stuff up like, well, in the beginning, animals could talk. Not true. Or how about, I heard this one, a priest before, right? There was a time when snakes had legs and then God cursed them and then they, the legs fell off and they had to crawl on their bellies. That's not, that's, that's stupid. Some of you going, that's what I thought. Well, that's dumb. It's just, don't believe that anymore, okay? So if it's not a talking snake, who or what is it? And the answer is, well, it's Satan, it's the devil. But, but here's an interesting fact. In the entire Old Testament, you find the word Satan used like, I think, 27 times But in the Old Testament, it has an article, the, in front of it every time, making it the Satan, or in Hebrew, Hasatan. So it's actually a job description of whatever this thing's doing. Kind of like the word angel is not this thing with wings, it just means messenger. And the job of the Satan is opposing or frustrating or or prosecuting someone. The Satan literally means the adversary. Satan means the adversary, all right? And it doesn't just apply to that being that we now call the devil. The, the adversaries all through the Bible. There's this one place in the book of Numbers where the angel of the Lord, which we find out from a few weeks ago, is the, the, the God embodied in the form of Jesus before he was born in Bethlehem. But the angel of the Lord plays the role of the Satan when he keeps a, a man named Gideon from going down the wrong road. It's not until we get to the New Testament the parts of the, of the Bible after the birth of Jesus, does the Bible make Satan a proper name and then looks back and assigns it to, to, to some Old Testament stories? And chapter three is definitely one that qualifies. So it's not a snake, but it's a serpent? Yes. 
Again, you got to put your head back in what people were thinking about 4,000 years ago when this was written, all right? Back then, people knew animals can't talk. So if an animal starts talking, they know this isn't an animal. It's not a snake or a serpent. It's, it's an appearance of a supernatural being. So the reader back then, when he or she read, you know, in Genesis, all right, uh, the serpent said to the woman, they jumped right to, uh-oh, this is not good, right? Someone in God's divine counsel is up to something bad. So whoever was talking to Eve there in the garden, and Adam was right there with her, we find out in a minute, it didn't freak her out. Like she'd seen him before, right? Because where God is, his divine council members are always there too. This one, we find out, doesn't like God's plan to share authority and dominion with people like us. So he makes his move. Now we're gonna get to that in a minute. So I just wanna take a time out and, and, and correct what I would call a, a Bible urban legend. That a bunch of Christians have just said, well, I heard that one time and I guess that's what it is, right? You know, about fallen angels and all this stuff. Listen, there is no place in the Bible that says that at some time before creation, Satan rebelled against God and took a third of the angels with him. It's not in the Bible. It's not, it's not in the Bible. There, there was no rebellion before Genesis chapter three. This is it. The only place where you find Satan connected to one third of the stars represented angels is in the book of Revelation, and we'll get to it, which references that when Jesus was born, which was a long time after creation, a war breaks out in the spiritual realm and Satan tries to, like a serpent, devour Jesus at his birth. We're gonna look at that at Christmas. It's gonna be a very Merry Christmas. Serpents, and it's gonna be great. He's trying to eat baby Jesus, okay? This is it. This is the number one, the first rebellion in Genesis chapter three, and it happens in Eden. But before we begin, a lot of history in this because I just want us to be informed about who our enemy is, all right? Before we look at what the serpent says to Eve, we can get a little bit more backstory on the serpent who will become known as Satan from some other places in the Bible. Because some other places that refer back to this event. You, know, you can look this up if you want or, or look it up later. Like, look at this. It's in Ezekiel chapter 28. Let me give you some history about Ezekiel, right? So Israel has been invaded by Babylon, a really bad country to the east, and has taken the Jewish people, most of them, captive and exiled them back to Babylon. Ezekiel is a prophet. He's imprisoned in Babylon. And in the section we're going to look at, the prophet Ezekiel is calling out the evil prince of Tyre due to his arrogance and putting himself in the place of God. So while Ezekiel is chastising the prince of Tyre, he's comparing the prince to another rebellion from the past. So he's he's going, hey, 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 prince, listen, what you're doing reminds me of something that happened a long time ago. So Ezekiel is talking about the prince of Tyre, but he's really talking about something else. Ezekiel chapter 28 says this, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect beauty. I mean, you had everything going for you. You were in Eden. Now we know the Prince of Tyre wasn't in Eden, okay? So he's talking about somebody else now, right? You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You see, you're just beautiful, right? You were, here it is, right? You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God, that's Eden, in the midst of the stones of fire, that's the sons of God, you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and so you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God. I kicked you out of Eden, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire." Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. Now that's Ezekiel. In another place, the prophet Isaiah uses the same comparison when he's calling out the evil king of Babylon. So we'll learn some things about this first rebellion right here like this. How you have fallen from heaven, O O day star, son of dawn. And son of dawn, when it translated into Greek into Latin, it it translates Lucifer. That's where we get that name. It means son of the dawn, right? How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, so this is what the serpent did at some time, right? I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Now, both prophets are pointing back to Genesis chapter 3. 
uh, a divine being, we find out is, it's a guardian cherub, all right? So it's a guardian being, all right? Which the reader would have been thinking of a supernatural creature that combines, and you've seen this all, especially in the book of Revelation, you see this, all right? It combines the features of a, of a man and an animal like a serpent who guarded the throne of God, who had close proximity to God while God is sitting on his throne. But, but, but the, in this case, the, the serpent, the guardian cherubim, doesn't want to submit to God. And he doesn't want to see God share authority with these humans. As, as a matter of fact, the, the, this, this cherub says, I'll be God. I, I, I'd, be make, I'd make a better God. I will rule over God. I will make myself like the most high God. And, and we'll see God responds, eat dirt. You want to be over everything? You're going to be under everything. But again, I'm jumping ahead of the story. So go back to this, all right? The serpent is having a conversation with, with Eve, all right? So he said to the woman, back in Genesis 3, did God actually say... You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. I'm gonna translate that, that verse for you, right? God's a liar. God's lying to you. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you because I care about you. He doesn't want you to experience all that is good and possible. God is actually holding back the good stuff. He's limiting what is possible for you. I thought you were created in the image of God, right? Why doesn't God want you to have what he has? Oh, oh, oh here, here's why. Next verse. For God, Elohim, right, knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like, and it's the same word, God's, knowing good and evil. Here's the conversation. Hey, 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 Eve, listen, you don't need God to run your life. You don't need anybody to tell you what to do. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, you, you could be like him. You could be like, you could be like God's. How about you decide what's good and evil for you? He gave you free will. Use it. So here we go on the journey. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was what? Right there with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And if you read the rest of that chapter, here's what follows. It's called it's the consequences he looks at both of them and says, oh, first of all, your days are numbered. You'll no longer be immortal like me. You will die. So you, you, you're exiled from the garden. And in Hebrew culture, to be kicked out of the community was the equivalent of death. But eventually, you will physically die. He looks at Adam. Adam, you're still commanded to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth. But from this point on, it's going to be really hard. Really frustrating, sweaty work. And in your insecurity, you will, you'll try to control and dominate everything, especially your wife. Eve, same thing for you. Be fruitful and multiply, but your life is about to get very painful. And you will forget where your value comes from and you'll try to seek it by trying to get a man's approval and you'll manipulate that man in order to protect yourself. In other words, here's the, 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 the plot change in the Bible, right? Naked and unashamed will be replaced by hiding and shameful insecurity. Have you ever been in that relationship? It started great, Right? And to the serpent, God, God says this. He says, the Lord, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days uh, of your life. And that right there, that's what both Ezekiel and Isaiah are, are, are referring to. Satan, the serpent, the accuser, the, the liar, is cast down to the ground. But in Hebrew, the word ground is eretz, and it isn't just the dirt, all right? It's the, it's the underworld. It's the place of the dead. So what God says to the serpent, to, to Satan is, hey, you want to be most high? You want to be king? Okay, how about this? You're king of the dead, which he is. Which he is. Any image bearer, any of us, all right, who bear God's image, who die, we belong to him and come under the rule of the prince of darkness, the king of the dead, unless... Something were to happen. And that image bearer is saved and connected to someone who can defeat death. And here's kind of a hint of what or, or who's coming. Look, next verse. I was God talking. I will put enmity or hostility between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And now we have the luxury of looking back, you know, 4,000 years from that it was written and go, this is one of the first prophecies about Jesus, the Messiah. We can see that looking back. But all those first readers knew when they read that or heard that story, it went like this. From now on, it will be Satan versus God. 
and hostility between those who belong to Satan, children of the devil. That's the phrase that Jesus used a lot when he called out people saying, you belong to your father, the devil. He said that several times. And those who belong to God, the children of God. Here's what Satan's main weapon is against you. Death. It's always there. It's always what we're afraid of. It's always hanging over us. But also God gives us a promise. Someday a human offspring of Eve's, Jesus, a son will be born and that son will defeat the serpent, will crush him. Interesting though, in, in, in Romans chapter 16, Paul says that the way God is going to crush the serpent is under our feet. Jesus living in us, in his church, we will crush Satan under our feet our feet. So let's just hit pause, all right? And let's go back and look at a part of the story that, that will feel very familiar to some of us because we're going to sit in here or we're going to watch and here's what we're going to go. There, that's talking about me, right? But before we get, here's some questions, all right? Big questions. And I've had some of these questions come in online. So first question is this, why is there evil, sickness, pain, and death in the world? Why is the world so screwed up? Here's the answer. Because people take God's good gift, free will, and abuse it. Got two deals on the table. God says this. Here's the other deal. I'm going with that one. And everything gets messed up. Why, God, why doesn't God just make it stop? And the answer is, he will. He can. But if he does it now, the way he would have to make it stop is he'd have to kill all of us or take away free will and just turn us into puppets. And, and if, if, if love and relationship and obedience are coerced you know, or forced instead of chosen, it's not really love. Love says, I have options, I choose you. There's a lot of women on the world, I choose Robin. I go home to Robin. There's a lot of options, on, I choose God. So one more question. So what is the cost? What is the wage of any and all sin? What, what's, what's the cost of abusing God's good gift? And the answer is death and separation from God. Here's how we, we know that. We, we know all that, right, right? So here's my question. Then why do we keep, up, keep on doing it? Why, why do we keep on abusing our free will, God's good gifts, all right? So let's go back to the conversation between the serpent and Eve. The serpent has just said, God's not telling you the truth. You decide what's right for you. Be your own God. And here, here Eve goes on this journey. And for the record, Adam is right there, just as guilty because he was right there. I would say Adam is more guilty because he watched his wife engage in a conversation that he should have stepped in and said, if you want to talk to her, you have to go through me. This is our job, husbands, right? Which is why when God shows up later in the story, the first person that he wants to talk to is the husband. Where were you? So here was the, their spiritual mental journey that we all go on. Look at this again, all right? When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Now, here's, here's all right? First of all, this is, this is how we all end up in a mess. She was in a conversation that she should never have been in, right? And then in the middle of that conversation, she saw it. And it just stirred up an appetite in her and she kept staring at it and goes, I want to eat it. I want to devour that. She told herself it would give her pleasure and satisfy her, herself. And then finally she decided this, right? And this is where we land. I want the thing that God says will kill me. I just don't think it'll kill me. God says, don't, I, listen, I, I, I don't believe him. I'm going to risk it. And, and Eve, she, she bit it, literally and figuratively, right, right, right? So application time, right? See, you're gonna see, this, this is just as true now as it was back then. This was written thousands of years ago, but nothing's changed. I mean, it's the same thing going on in our lives. How many of our, uh, definitely my, biggest regrets follow the same path? I was someplace I shouldn't have been. I was looking at something or talking to or listening to someone who, in the moment, I knew this isn't good. This is, this is very different than what Jesus says is the way and the truth that leads to abundant life. And as I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of that mess, I see it. I see her. I see him. I, I see it, whatever. And I start thinking about it. And then I just kept thinking about it. And I, I got obsessed with it, right? And I thought to myself, I, I want that. I, I, I want her. I want him. What are I, 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 want, I, want, I want to consume that, all right? And here, I get to the point where I, I, will, I will starve to death if I don't have that. And then the mental spiritual gymnastics go, really, did God really mean that? Did God really say, I mean, maybe it doesn't mean that. Maybe it doesn't mean that anymore. Or we get right to, that's not true. 
Because I, I know me and I think I know what I need. I, I think this will make me happy. I, I think this will satisfy what I'm missing in my life. I, I think that this is different. It might be right for other people, but not for me. And, and okay, it's not, it's not right, but it's not that bad. And I'm just going to do it one time. Famous last words. And I, I don't see how this is going to kill me. And I don't even think I'll get caught. So no, God, I will decide what is good and evil for me. I'll be my own God. And then you do it. Do you remember? And you take a bite. And in that moment, you discover you make a horrible God. You're a trash God, all right? Because come, come to find out, and, and, and remember that, that panicky moment when you realized it? You realized it was evil and it killed more than you ever thought or imagined it could kill and it separated you from the people in your life that you love the most and it feels like you just walk around feeling like something just died and it puts a wedge between you and God. You don't even want to look at God. You feel so ashamed. We've all been in the garden. We've all been in that garden conversation and taken this mental and spiritual and emotional journey. What do you mean all? All have sinned. That's what that is. And fallen short of the glory of God. So what's the solution? Like, we're all sitting there going, okay, what do we do now? Well, let's go back and review some things that we've covered and see if they, they apply to this, this, this story today, all right? So first, I, I, I love this, all right? Um, kind of had an aha moment a few weeks ago. You can't surprise or disappoint God. Remember? Like, he knew what he was getting when he created you and saved you. That does not mean that it was God's will or plan that you did that thing. He just knew that you would do it, which is why in advance, he had a plan prepared and ready for you and I to come to our rescue, right? Look at this. Three of my favorite verses in the Bible. Romans chapter five. It says this, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for who? Christ died for who? See, this is all the people that go like, I'll, I'll, I'll be good and then I'll go to church and then God can set me. No, no, no. He died for you when you were ungodly. Okay, keep going. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. There's some people in this world that I would die for. My, my wife, my kids, my grandkids. Not you, probably. I'm, I'm just being honest with you. Maybe a couple. No, no, no one, I don't think. Uh, but, um, but, 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 but for someone good, I might, I might give my life. But look at this. But God, and if you have your Bible with you, just underline that every time you see it, because but God says he's totally different than me. But God shows his love for us in that while we were, what's the word? Still sinners. Christ died for us. I'll tell you what, for years, those three verses, I held on to them. I mean, desperately held on to them, hoping that maybe there's a chance for someone like me. Because when I read while we were still sinners, it gets very specific for me. Like I know, I know my sin. I'm not gonna confess it to you. It's none of your business. Jesus knows it's taken care of, right? But I, I, I remember, listen, the moment I remember the room. I remember the wallpaper. I, I remember the smell. I remember the lighting, everything, right, right? My most shameful, dirty, deserves hell moment I know it, and, and, and here's what, this is a story I make up in my head. While I was doing that, I see Jesus being there in that room too. I didn't know it, but he was in that room too. And he looks at his father and he says, Jim's gonna need me, so I'll die for that now so that one day he will turn to me and receive forgiveness and reconciliation, and it was ready. And he did that for me and he did that for you at just the right time while we were still in the middle of that room. So when the day came, and I, I, here's what you mean why God brought you in or have you, have you listened today? Maybe that's today for you. Like, I need you in my life and everything is ready. From day one, chapter three, all right? This has always been God's mission with us and for us. Do you remember what happens right after this, this whole, you know, they ate the, the, they ate the fruit and they, they go and they hide, right? They go in the hide and God comes looking for them. It's the first appearance of God embodied as a man walking in the garden. So I believe that it's, it's a form of Jesus before he was born. And as, as he's walking through the garden, he's calling out, where are you? Who lied to you? What have you done? Now, right, this is good. Whenever God asks a question, it's not because he needs information. He knows everything. What he's doing is giving us a chance, an invitation to come back in his direction so that he can do what only he can do. Forgive the unforgivable. You have one of those? An unforgivable? Heal the brokenness. Even resurrect the dead parts of your life. Pay the price that you 
cannot pay. Do you know what? I think I'm going to stump you on this one. Do you know what the first recorded death is in the Bible? And it's not Cain and Abel in the next chapter. No, no, look at this, all right? And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. The wages of sin is death, and God kills an animal and covers them in a garment made out of that animal skin. I, I, think, I think this is a shadow of the sacrificial system that's going to come in place for the next 2,000, 3,000 years to kind of like temporarily like cover our sins, but ultimately it points to the only death and sacrifice that could do it on the level it needs to be done, the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus. I don't know what your unforgivable is. I don't know what your, your, your brokenness is. I don't know what the dead thing in your life is. I, I believe that God brought you in this room to say, we've all been there. We've all been in the garden. We've all, we've all taken a bite of the wrong thing. And it's not too late for us. So I had, a, I had a, the worship team. I, I talked about this a couple weeks ago. I had the whole worship staff come out to my, my back porch the other day. And we just started reminiscing about you know, what God is doing at Flatirons. And uh, they were going to go away on a writing retreat right after this. And so we sat on the back porch and we just talked about the things about Flatirons that we really like, 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 um, like bumping into Jesus. Like some of us are bumping into Jesus for the first time, or uh, we keep it real. We're raw and real. Sometimes we're, we're inappropriate, but you know, pray for me. But, uh, but there's all these little things that make Flatirons Flatirons. And then uh, this came up several times. I really love this phrase, from now on. See, and again, I'm gonna talk about this every, every time I get up here, right? The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is you cannot change your past. Wouldn't that be great? If that didn't happen. Like, like we have amnesia. It's like, you know, right? no, 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 no. You cannot change your past. It happened. It, it made us kind of who we are today, all right? Good, bad, ugly, whatever that is. So what do we have now? Like from now on. What am I going to do from now on? Am I going to keep on going back to the wrong tree? Am I going to keep on going on that same spiritual journey of spiraling down and then have that panic moment going, oh no, I've done it again. See, here's what I know about the past. You know what I, my past is full of? Condemnation. Um, death, shame, failure, insecurity. But what I, what I read from Jesus is that from now on, there is no condemnation. The old is gone. The new has come. Let, let's press on to what God has in mind for us. So uh, at all our campuses, let's stand up. Uh, we, we, we landed on that, that from now on. And then these super talented people go to the mountains and they come back with this song. And this is the first time we've ever sang it. So nobody knows it. <laughs> okay. But we're all going to learn it together because I think it's going to be like, um, like maybe our theme song. Um, our, our anthem, like, can't change my past, but it's not going to define me anymore. From now on, I'll follow Christ. So let me pray, and then don't, you don't want to leave early, all right? There's no traffic out there. They're all at home, right? right? So you'll be, you'll be fine, but um, let me pray, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll teach you this, this beautiful song. God, I don't, I don't know why everybody's here. I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what they're struggling with. So I'll just speak for myself and maybe somebody else can relate to it. God, I'm stuck. And I need some stuff to change and I don't know what to do. I've, I've tried my best and it just gets worse. And I need your help. I think I'm speaking for a lot of people. If I got a do-over, I would do some stuff different. But that doesn't seem to be an option. So my only option is to grab you by the hand and say, from now on, I'll follow you, Jesus. Will you do this with me, Jesus? Will you walk with me, Jesus? Even the consequences, they're gonna keep on following me. Will you, will, you, will you give me strength to keep on going? Like from now on. Until I see you face to face. That's my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey everyone, thanks again for joining us here at Flatirons Church Online. If you didn't know, we stream every weekend and we're dropping content throughout the week. And so be sure to subscribe to our channels. Now, if you want to support Flatirons and its ministry here, reaching people in a lost and broken world, we'd love for you to hit that Give Now button. 
Uh, thanks again for being here, and we can't wait to see you either online or in person next week.